Today we celebrate our mothers individually as well as just motherhood generally. And so we just thank you for all you do for our families. I thank you just for those of you in our church for uh, the role you play as a female leader for our children here. And I just thank you. I uh, look around with uh, my kids at the different women that are in their life. And while no woman will ever have as big a role or impact in her life as Rachel does, and I'm so thankful for her, I'm just thankful for all the women who I can see in their lives, from teachers to those of you in the church, just for the things that you're pouring into them, I thank you for that. So everybody, please make sure you make your mother or wife uh, or any other mothers in your life uh, feel special today. Make them, help them know what they mean to you. Uh, and also, if you forgot that today is Mother's Day, here's your reminder. Go ahead and pause this video, hurry up, get out to Walgreens, Walmart, get a card, get some flowers. You're welcome. Um, Secondly, I want to this morning just take a chance to say that this will be the last Sunday, at least for now, who knows what the future holds, but at least for now, it's going to be the last Sunday that I will be preaching to an empty auditorium or sanctuary, uh, so I'm very thankful for that, but we're going to see how it goes next week, and we're going to do some social distancing worship together, and so next Sunday, we're going to gather together, first service will be at 9.30, uh, I'm going to put out some ways to contact me. I'll get to you guys about that throughout the week, uh, but we're going to have 10 people in a service, and if uh, enough of you guys feel comfortable to come at 9.30 and we fill up, then I'll have another service immediately following that one. And I'll stay here however long it takes to get everybody through here 10 at a time that wants to come worship with us. Uh, I'm just really excited about this. I've been missing seeing you guys. Well, you know, I'm so thankful for the technology we have, and it's great that we're able to sing together and you know that you can hear what God's put on my heart each week and not only that but we can see pastors and churches around the country and around the world and worship in that way and I'm so thankful for this day and age that we can do that but there's just no replacement for coming together and seeing each other and we will be uh, careful we're going to have some hand sanitizer put out we're not going to be staying close to each other uh, you know while I do take the Bible to be true we're not going to be greeting each other with a holy kiss um, maybe a holy handshake. Not, that's not even a good idea. How about a holy hand wave? We'll go that. And so uh, we're going to be as safe as we can. And so please come and join us. Get in contact with me uh, if you would like to attend next Sunday. As I said, I'll be getting in touch with many of you. But if you want to get in touch with me, my phone number is 217-413-8385. Email is setcenters at gmail.com. So please just let me know if you want to come join us and I will get all the times figured out, and uh, we'll see where we can go from there. But um, again, this is if you feel safe. We're, I'm going to keep filming the services, so um, you're still going to have the opportunity to be able to worship at home. If you feel like you're high risk or just don't feel comfortable yet being around groups of people, I totally get it. That's totally fine. So uh, let me know that too, and I will make sure that you are getting the services each week uh, sent to you or that you can find them somehow. So I will make sure that. You are not going without our services. I'm not trying to guilt anybody into coming. I'm just trying to bring us together, those of us who feel safe and uh, feel comfortable to do so, because like I said, I don't think there's any replacement for the in-person fellowship that we can have. Uh, that being said, that's the only thing that we're going to be doing for now on Sundays. We're not going to have Sunday school, children's church. Uh, we're not going to uh, start doing lunches together just yet. Um, I think those are for obvious reasons, but you know, those kind of bring us in too close of a contact for too long of a period of time, I think. But we're able to separate and spread out in here definitely with no more than 10 people, we can do it. And that is completely within the guidelines the governor has put out there. So uh, I just ask you to join me in praying for our church going forward, our state, our country going forward uh, with everything that's going on. And so actually, let's just take a chance right now as we look towards the future with what's going on and take a time to pray for that. So God, we come to you right now, and uh, Lord, we just put all this, uh, all these things into your hands that are going on right now with the coronavirus, with the lockdown, or quarantine, or whatever we're calling it, and Lord, I just know that while this virus is dangerous, there are uh, so many other issues going on with people out of work, with businesses closed, with uh, people stuck at home, and uh, maybe not the best situation, whether it was neglect or abuse, Lord, and Lord, I know that there's uh, suicides have already gone up and the rates are expected to just climb over the next few years with the hardships that are going to come as a result of this. And 
or in a, or in a situation that there is no one right or easy answer. And while we're quick to be able to criticize our leaders and those making decisions, and Lord, uh, while we might not agree with everything, Lord, I, I just pray that we show grace to each other, show grace to our leaders, and Lord, and just a tough situation all around. We just put it in your hands. We trust you. And Lord, help us during the time when we have so little control over so many things. Help us to follow what we do now. Help us to love each other. Help us to love you. Help us to show compassion and mercy. And Lord, in the end, just help us to focus on you and what you have for us to do during this time to be able to love our neighbor and be able to serve each other. Pray things in your name. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, I was thinking about what I talked about last week with those uh, prophecies from the Old Testament that I talked about how they relate to the New Testament church, that yes, God does have a future and a hope for us, and he knows he has the plans he has for us, but it's not to restore our country to any sort of greatness it ever had. It's, you know, it's not to bring us back from uh, quarantine, as it were. It's not to bring us back from captivity in the same way that it was for the people in Babylon at that time, but we know that God has a plan for Christians, and our future and hope is glorious, it is eternal, we will be in his presence forever, and we can trust in that. We know that 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we know that God promises that he will hear when his people who are called by his name come into his temple and pray, and we know we are the temple. So when we come to him and we pray, he might not heal our land specifically, he might not heal all of the things going on around us, but he will hear us and he will heal us. Not physically always, but definitely spiritually, definitely emotionally, he will heal us. And so I want us to look at uh, a New Testament passage that goes along with those types of thoughts that God is in control and God has plans for us and God is looking out for us. And so join me, if you will, in Philippians chapter 4. Starting in verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gracious, graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, because once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make, <clears throat> excuse me, I know both how to make do with a little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. So, in the end there, we come to Philippians 4.13, a very famous verse, a very well-known verse, a very taken out of context verse at times. It's, uh, it's almost seen as the, in the same vein as God helps those who help themselves. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I just set my mind to it, if I just believe it, I can achieve my dreams, and God will be there to strengthen me along the way. And I think probably most often I see this taken out of context with, uh, you know, career aspirations or really with sports and sports goals. I see people, uh, their shirts that are out there for workout gear that you can achieve your workout goals if you just have Christ strengthening you. Yeah. Kind of a lazy metaphor, if you ask me, that you see the word strength and so you put it together with weight training, but that's me. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of Christian athletes put it on their clothes, put it on their shoes, and I can just, I can win this championship if Christ is strengthening me. And I, I, I know I can do it. I always wonder what happens when two people with Philippians 4.13 written on their shoes come up against each other in a championship. I don't, I don't know if God just strengthens one more than the other or how that works. But I will say that this verse, it, it doesn't promise victory in our goals. It doesn't promise us that we're going to uh, win all of our events, all of our sporting events that we're involved in or anything like that. It has to do with, I am able to be the Christian I'm supposed to be. I'm able to be the person I'm supposed to be in God because Christ is the one who strengthened me. Whenever Jesus was talking to his disciples, we see in the book of John, he promised, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm leaving you with the helper, the Holy Spirit. And he is going to help you. He is going to strengthen you. So we see here, that is what this verse is talking about, is you can do all things that God has called you to do 
through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, who is strengthening you, who is in you, who is leading you. And so with this uh, passage, I want us to see what does that mean for us as Christians today? How does that apply to us today? Well, first I want us to think about just this book as a whole. I love the book of Philippians. Um, Paul is definitely the missionary of all missionaries. He is the church planter of the New Testament. Uh, he went all over the known world planting churches, and after he left, he still had concern for these people. It wasn't just a, you know, a project that he started, but he still had a heart everywhere he ever went. And he wrote these letters, and they make up most of our New Testament, these letters he wrote to churches. And most of these letters have some mean things to say. He has to get after some of these churches because they're just not doing the things they should do. Um, but I love Philippians because it seems like a church that, well, I don't think we can assume they were perfect, seems like they had it together pretty well. And instead of Paul just saying, hey, good job, guys, you got it, keep going. There's, there's another level. He, he's so anxious that he doesn't have to get after them about doing the stupid things. You know, he's not writing to them like the Corinthians where he's saying, you guys, why are you being so mean to each other? Why are you allowing blatant sins to just exist in your midst? He doesn't have to say that to the Philippians. And it's so cool to read this book where it's this idea that not doing the bad stuff is not the end of the road for the Christian. And Paul goes to say in this book, I almost see it as, you know, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, like Christianity 101. And here he gets to go to Christianity 201. It's like, hey, congrats, let's go to the next level. Let's see what else there is. And this book, its themes are pretty much very personal. He's talking about humility. He's going against pride throughout this book. He's telling us to be like Christ in our humility. And he's telling us to constantly be vigilant about sharing our faith and about bringing people up and discipling each other. And he talks about here in this chapter the importance of setting our mind on Christ, of being content, of being at peace, of just following Christ and his example, of not any one specific thing, but everything. Once we're practicing humility, and once we're uh, our heart is on loving others through meeting their needs and sharing the gospel, he goes to this very, you know, this last chapter here, ending it with, set your mind on things that are above, as he says elsewhere, but whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, think about these things. Set your mind what is above. Rejoice in the Lord. Be thankful and be content. Now, it's interesting to me at the end of this book that's telling us or this letter is telling us all these things that we need to do to take it to the next level of Christian living, of becoming holy, of becoming as Jesus is. And at the very end of it all, he almost summarizes it, that, and here is how to be content. If you were to ask people, what do you want in this life? What is it you're striving for? What, what is it all about? I don't think you're going to get the answer, well, I just want to be content. Very few people will ever give you that answer. But that's what Paul says, that the goal of uh, the Christian life, really, in our personal walk, is to be content. And, of course, that is not in and of itself the end message, because there is a lot of things that go into what that means. To be content in Christ is to live according to his commandments, is to live lovingly towards him and to others, is to, um, you know, just like the book said before, to be humble, to practice the humility of Christ. There's so many things that go into that. But at the end of it all is, are you content in this life? Are you like Paul who says in Philippians 1, I can't wait to go to heaven. I, I, I just, my reward's there in front of me. I can't wait. But I got some stuff I got to do here. Jesus, God has still kept me here for a reason. And so while I'm here, I have some work to do. And I'm okay with that. And so Paul's saying this world might be difficult. He says it right here. I know how to have plenty, but I know how to be hungry. I know how to have nothing. And I know how to be content in both those circumstances. Not just content, but productive. I know how to keep going with what God has for me to do in all of those circumstances. And so we see in this passage many great things about how to live a good life, but any of them taken out of context just becomes some psycho babble. Um, you know, you could look in here and say, it's all about being, you know, just content. Just be content. And you could take that so far out of context you could start viewing it the way the, the world views it, and view it in terms of your possessions, that I just got to be happy with what I have. But no, you have to be happy with having Christ, even if you have nothing else. It's not about having little, it's 
by having everything in Christ. So it's not contingent according to the world that I don't need a million dollars a year. I'm just happy with fifty thousand dollars a year. Are you okay with homelessness and hunger if you have Christ? That's where that's at. Obviously, setting your mind on positive things, the power of positive thinking. There are books that are filling libraries right now about that very topic. And so it's not like Paul has a unique idea here of set your things on things that are set your mind on things that are better. Don't get down. Don't think about bad things. Don't dwell on the past. Every religion in the world, every uh, school of philosophy has some form of that. You know, Stoicism, going back to uh, the time that this was written, they were talking about just, you know, just think positively. Don't let the world get to you. Just focus on being happy with what you have, and you're fine. Well, it sounds like Christianity, except when we go back in history and read that the Stoics were actually at odds with the Christians. Because Christians don't think we have it in and of ourselves that we can be content or that we can be positive. We don't believe it's a human capability apart from Christ. And so everything in this book, everything in this chapter, while it's so good that we should rejoice, we should be thankful, we should think about positive things, we should be content, none of it's possible without Christ. While the center of the gospel is salvation from our sins, the center of everything that comes after is living in Christ. The gospel saves us from our sins, but man, sanctification is such a beautiful process afterwards. The idea that we grow closer to Christ, we grow more in Christ, and that just the life that that can provide for us. Not a life that achieves the American dream per se, but the life that can achieve peace and serenity and contentment, all because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside us and we have God the Father. We are saved through the Son. We can do everything in this life because Jesus is the one strengthening us. We can walk through this difficult time. We can continue to do what God calls us to do with the sharing the gospel, discipling each other, loving our neighbor, whatever that looks like in this new context. Obviously not going over to their house, but you know whatever that looks like, being able to help people and be there for people. We can do those things through Christ who strengthens us. In this time that is so full of fear and the unknown, we can get through it because Christ strengthens us. Not because we know what the end result is going to be here on earth. I don't think anybody can guess what direction this is going to go in the end. So, plenty of conspiracy theories if you want to look for those, but we, we really don't know. But can we get through this? Can we be hopeful through this? Can we be positive? Can we be loving during this time? Because Christ is strengthening us. And so that's my challenge to all of us today. Well, I mean, so many negative emotions are running rampant right now, and uh, so much fear. Can we be the church? Can we be Christians according to what this is saying? I can do all things. I can be content right now. I can be positive right now because I have Christ strengthening me. Not the world trying to give me hope of the future, but Christ, who I know holds my future in his hand. And I know he knows the plans he has for me. And those plans for a hope, the plans for a future. And so can we trust in Jesus? That he really does strengthen us. He really does take care of us. And if we just follow him, all will be well. Let's pray together. Lord, we just put ourselves in your hands as we uh, as we like to try to help you out so often. And Lord, we, we think we know what's best. And Lord, we just kind of start with you, but then go off on our own. And especially in this, this time, these circumstances, Lord. We're so easily distracted from you and from what you have for us, Lord, we, we just feel like we should be able to solve every single problem this world has. But Lord, sometimes the solution doesn't come on this side of heaven. Lord, help us to understand that. Help us to be strengthened with the hope that we have of spending eternity with you, Lord. In the meantime, help us to be content. Help us, well, you know, many people will have very little throughout this time. Help us to love each other and make sure we're there to provide what we can. But in the meantime, to show people that the ultimate hope is not in our economy, it's not in uh, vaccines, Lord, but it's in you. And help us to just love you with love. We pray in your name.